What's going on guys? Today we're looking at multimeter basics. So we're going to cover the very essentials like how to use your meter to measure voltage, how to use it to measure current, and then using those two values how to determine your power. Pretty much all the digital multimeters out there look very similar. Chances are if you have one it's going to look something like this too. At the top of it you're going to have your LCD screen. That'll be the readout that you get all of your information from obviously. And below that, you've got a little dial with a number of different settings on it. We're only worried about a couple of them. DC voltage is one, so that's the V with the line and the dash line. There's another type of voltage you can select, which is AC voltage or the squiggly one. We don't give a shit about that. That is kind of useless to us because we're measuring the output of the driver in most cases. If we measure the input, we might be looking for the AC, but stick to DC voltage for the output. And on the side, you've also got current. So I have an A and an MA, which is amps and milliamps, and then a microamp setting, but I'll never need the microamps. So if you want to measure current, then just move it over to the A setting. At the bottom of the meter, there are a few different locations that you can plug in your probes or leads, and it is absolutely imperative that you get these right, depending on what you're trying to measure. The black one always gets plugged into the common terminal, but the red one that depends what you're trying to measure. If you're looking for volts, plug it into the one that says V. If you're measuring current, you have to switch it over. My meter actually tells me that you've, you're a dipshit. You gotta move this thing over because the leads are incorrectly connected. So since I'm on the A setting on the dial, I have to move over to the A setting on the jack as well. Now it's happy, right? One thing that you absolutely have to make sure that you don't do, which I myself have done a couple times, of course, but if you're measuring current, like I am here, I've got the dial set to amps and I've got the lead plugged into the A jack. If you do this and you decide that you want to switch to voltage, you absolutely have to remember to move that lead over to the voltage jack. So even if you move the dial over, it doesn't matter. Like you're not really doing anything by moving that dial. And luckily my meter screams at me and says, you got to move this thing, but yours may not. So if you move that over and you're trying to measure volts, if you're plugged into the amp terminal, there's essentially a short circuit between them in the meter and you're going to short whatever you're measuring. So do not forget to move this over to the voltage terminal if you're coming from measuring amps. And obviously disconnect your meter and, and make this change before you measure, right? Don't do it on the fly because that's not going to work. So disconnect your meter, move the jack over, move the dial over, then you can measure. If you have a closer look at the jacks, you'll see that there are limits printed on here. On the amp setting of mine, I have a max of 10 amps. So if I try to measure more than that, it's going to blow the fuse. On my microamp jack, it's a maximum of 400 milliamps. And then there's also going to be a voltage maximum as well. And definitely respect that because safety first and you shouldn't exceed the capabilities of your meter. Some multimeters have an auto ranging function, which is really handy to have. And it will automatically adjust the range based on what it is you're measuring. You may not have auto ranging, so you might have to select it yourself. I'm doing that manually with this range button here. For example, set to this range when I'm measuring this battery, I'm getting a readout of 7.7 .7 volts, but I would like a lot more accuracy. So I'm going to change the range manually to get something like 7.702 volts, which is a lot more information, right? So you may have to do this with a button if you don't have auto range, or you may have to do it with the dial. You might have a number of different DC voltage settings on the dial itself. So I have just the one DC volt setting, but you may have a two or a 20 or a 200 that you can choose. So you, you'll just have to find the range that works best for whatever you're measuring. If you're looking for recommendations on what type of meter to buy, that's sort of out of the scope of this video, but I will tell you where I did all my research when I bought mine, and that is the EEV blog. So at the forum, there's a really good post that's uh, written up and it has pretty much every meter that you can think of and it's got a color-coded legend for features that are great on it, features that are good, things that are missing, so it really makes sorting through them much easier. And I would also advise checking out some of the YouTube videos from Dave over at EEV blog. He's got a lot of great stuff about meters, so if you're looking for some advice, check this stuff out. And as always, feel free to shoot me a PM and I'm happy to try and help you out. Okay, let's get started with measuring voltage. So when you're measuring the voltage on an LED system, what you're doing is measuring the potential difference, the electrical potential difference between two points. So you're measuring across things. For example, if you wanted to measure the voltage across a certain cob, you'd put your positive probe on the positive side and you'd put your negative probe on the negative side of it. And you might come up with something like 36 volts. If you were to say, take the positive wire from your driver and measure two points along that wire, well, there's no difference between those points, right? There's no drop. So you're gonna have a voltage of zero there. But 
as you go across things like a cob, you might have 36 volts on one. If you measure across two cobs, you'll have double that. So say 72, three would be 108 volts. I've found that measuring voltage and current in a series system like the one that I've got in the diagram here is considerably easier than doing a parallel system because in series, generally, there are unused connectors on each cob. Like on a, a typical holder like this, you'll see that there are actually two connections for each polarity. So you've got two holes for positive and two holes for negative. So in a typical series circuit, this makes measuring voltage very easy because only one of these connectors per polarity is being used to actually complete the circuit. So that leaves one available for you to stick a wire into and put that on your meter and measure the voltage. And then as far as current goes, really you can interrupt the circuit anywhere and measure current and it's going to be the same throughout the whole circuit, right? So it's easy to get access to measure voltage and you can break the circuit anywhere to measure the current. So series is just typically easier than parallel. Now let's have a look at this in practice. In front of me, I've got four Citizen CLU 048-1212s and I've got a Meanwell HLG 320HC 1750A. What I'm going to do is measure each of the voltages across the cobs. I'll measure the entire circuit and uh, show you how it's done. So I think this is probably the safest way to do it. I'm using these little Wagos with small wires. These came in a little electronics kit so they have a nice point to them. And uh, you could use any old wire though, it would work just fine. But these are just kind of handy for me because it's easier to get them out too. So I'm just jamming them into the first cob here. Like I said, there's one extra hole in each of these little connectors or holders. So I'm just going to put these in and then clamp them down onto the probes of my meter. So it's a good connection, it's safe, it's completely shielded, I'm not going to get shocked or anything. And uh, it's, it's nice and sturdy as well. So now we're measuring across one single cob. We're going to light this thing up and check the voltage on this cob alone. So turn it on and I can see that right now there's 33.67 odd volts across this one single cob. And obviously that will change as I increase the power. As you put more current through the whole circuit, it's going to drive the voltage up across each one of these cobs. It gets up 36, 37 volts, right? So. The voltage across these things will be similar, but probably not the same, because in a series circuit, you're gonna have different voltage drops, but the current's gonna remain the same, right? So, but I can use this technique here to continue to measure across cobs. For example, I can check the voltage between the first two cobs. So I've got my positive on the positive of the second one and negative on the negative of the first, and I can see that I've got 67.5 roughly volts dropping across these two cobs. And if I go to 3, we're seeing a total drop of about 101 volts. And then if I add the fourth ones, so we've got the voltage drop of the entire circuit. Then we're looking at about 135 volts. And this is going to be the same if I measure on, the either, on either side of the cobs or if I just measure right at the connectors that come off the driver. See, I've got these other big waggos. I can just stick my probes right into there and I can measure the voltage drop of the entire circuit using those two. It's going to be the same as the connectors on the cobs. And the reason that you see a different voltage here, we're seeing like a little over 135, is because I had kind of messed with the potentiometer in between shots, so obviously it's changed a little bit, but otherwise it will be the exact same. You could go on either side of the four cobs or at the first two terminals on the driver. It's the same thing. When it comes to measuring voltage in a parallel system, it's not as bad as having to measure current, but still sometimes you have to get a little bit creative because typically when you wire things in parallel and you have some stuff daisy chained together, it eats up all the open connectors, right? You have positive and negative in and then you're running positive and negative out to the next board or cob or whatever. So you just have to find a way to wire it so that you can get your probe in somewhere. And the nice thing is that the voltage is gonna be the same throughout the whole system, right? You could measure it right at the driver or at one of the boards and that voltage should remain the same everywhere. Measuring current in these systems is an entirely different animal. So you're no longer measuring across things. What you're doing is putting your multimeter in line with things. So to illustrate this, have a look at this diagram here, starting with the driver. The positive wire coming from that driver that goes into the WAGO. That current is flowing through the wire into the WAGO. Then from the WAGO, it's flowing into that red lead from the multimeter and it's going through the circuitry in the multimeter, which is measuring the current, then coming out on the black wire, which is connected to the first cob in series. So you can kind of imagine the red and the black leads 
as connected. They're kind of like one long wire with a multimeter in between them, and they allow current to flow through it, and that's how it's measured. And in a series circuit like this, it doesn't matter where you break the connection to insert the multimeter. So you could do it on the start like I did, or you could say break it after the first cob like this, or you could even put it at the end on the negative wire. When you're reading current, the polarity of the probes isn't really that big of a deal. The worst case scenario would be if you, if you mix them up and you put the red one where the black one should be, then you'll just get a negative reading on your meter. Instead of, say, 1400 milliamps, it'll say negative 1400 milliamps, so not a big deal there. Really, the important thing is that you wire it properly. It's wired in series with whatever you're trying to measure, and you're not shorting anything out. Whether it says negative or positive, it's, it doesn't really matter. You're going to get a proper reading, it just might not be the right sign. Let's see what this actually looks like. So step one, like I mentioned before, move the jack over, start with that. So we're going from the voltage jack to the current jack, or A, and swinging the multimeter over to read the DC current. Now, what we have to do is find a way to insert the meter into this. So what I think I'm gonna do is kind of what I did in the diagram. I'm just gonna take the positive lead that's connected to the driver, so that's this red wire that I'm pulling out. I'll hook that up into the red side of the multimeter, and then what I'll do is take the black lead from the multimeter, put that in a wago, and connect that up to the first cob. So the multimeter is now in between, the current is flowing out of the driver into the meter, and then back out of the meter into the first cob. And since this is a series circuit, we know that the current is going to be the same everywhere. And if I measure it at the start, it's going to be the same through each one of the four cobs all the way right through to the end. In this case, we see that all the way at the bottom, we're getting about 670 milliamps. Then if we turn the pot all the way up to max, we should be seeing at least 1750, which is what the driver's rated for. And we're actually seeing just over two amps. So you get a little bit more current with these A versions of the drivers. And if you had a B version, once you max that pot out, you're not gonna see this much current. You probably see maybe a little over 1750, but nowhere near two amps. So. That's kind of a neat thing about the A version of each of these drivers. Like I talked about in my diagram, it doesn't matter where you break the chain to put the multimeter in series. In this case, I'm gonna take the connection between the first two cobs, I'll break that and put the meter in between them, and you'll see that you get the exact same reading as you would if you were on the beginning or the end of the chain. It doesn't really matter where you put the thing in a series circuit, you're gonna get the same reading. So it gives you a little bit of flexibility there. Like I had mentioned before, if you happen to get the probes backwards, it's not a big deal. As I'm showing you now, if you put the red one where the black one should be, and vice versa, the worst thing that happens is that your readout is just a negative readout. So instead of saying 600 milliamps, it'll say minus 600 milliamps. So no big deal there, and not really something that you need to worry too much about. Measuring current on a parallel daisy chain system can be a bit of a pain in the ass just because of how daisy chaining works. In this case, I have two runs coming off of my driver, and on each run there are two quantum boards connected in parallel. So if I measure at the start of each of the runs, for example, I'm looking at the left two boards, I can only see that the two boards are pulling 4.3 amps, and I can't really differentiate which is pulling what. So I would have to probably interrupt between the first and the second board, figure out what the one isolated board is running, and then subtract that from that total. So let's say the second board's pulling two amps, and I know that together they're pulling 4.3, so I would be able to deduce then that the first one must be pulling 2.3 amps. Another way that you can do this is if you home run every one of the boards back to like one single splice point, let's say you got a Wago that splits out and uh, everything runs back to that point, then you can use the wires at that point and interrupt each of the boards individually there. So they're not daisy chained, but they're each spliced into this one big splice. So it is kind of a pain in the butt having to do it. And this is where having a clamp ammeter is a godsend because you can just clamp onto each of the wires. But if you don't have a clamp, it can certainly be done. It just might take a little bit more work, but a little more work is what DIY LED is all about. Okay, cool. So now we know how to measure voltage, we know how to measure current. How do we get power from these two values? Well, it's super easy. All you need to do is multiply your voltage in volts by your current in amps and you'll get power in watts. So for example, if you measure 36 volts across a cob and you know that there's 1.4 amps in that circuit, 36 volts by 1.4 amps is 50.4 watts. And you just have to make sure that you get your units right, right? 
if you measure 36 volts and 600 milliamps, then just make sure you go 36 volts times 0.6 amps, right? 600 milliamps is 0.6 of an amp. So get that right, and uh, in this case, you've got 21.6 watts. Now, it's it's definitely doable to use one meter to take both measurements. It's not ideal. If you have two, that's great because you can measure them simultaneously. In this case, I have my fluke meter and I have another meter, an X-Tech, that's not fantastic. It's a clamp ammeter, which is actually really handy. I just don't trust the accuracy of this one in particular. If you have an accurate clamp, it's so nice because you just put the clamp around one of the wires, positive or negative or whatever, and it will give you that current flowing through it without having to interrupt anything. But uh, this meter is kind of good enough for my purposes here, just as a rough measurement. With the double meter setup, I can see that I'm getting about 135 volts and 0.7 of an amp, so there are 95 watts flowing through this circuit right now. On a circuit with different components, you can move the meters around and check what each of the components is pulling for power. For example, the cobs are pulling about 50 watts here, whereas the QB is taking closer to 70 watts, and it's kind of neat to be able to see in real time how much power each of these things is eating up. That is going to about do it for the multimeter basics. Please do me a favor and give me a little bit of a subarino. And if you have time, check out my website, www.ledgardener.com. There's plenty more instructional articles and videos just like this. So please check it out, stick around, and we'll be coming back with some more good stuff in the very near future. We'll see you then.